Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for joining us here on the podcast. This is episode 38. And once again, we've got our great friend, our teammate here at the Turtle Room and also owner of the of Garden State Tortoise, Chris Leone, on with us. And as always, you can see the big man, Anthony, sitting there just kind of chilling out. So thanks again for joining us. And tonight we're going to just – we're going to talk baby turtles. I mean, who doesn't love baby turtles? So um, sit back, get your questions ready, throw them into the YouTube chat, and we'll try to answer your questions about the turtles we're talking about. So, Anthony, I'll let you uh, kind of take it from there, bro. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode. Happy to be here uh, with two of my best buds and happy to be talking about something. I mean, so sometimes we have to stretch a little bit. You know, sometimes you have to kind of come up with creative things. And I know some of you are, are watching and saying, you guys never stretch. You just talk about whatever you want to. But we actually do try. This is one of the times where we don't have to try at all. This is just going to be like a conversation that the three of us have all the time. And that's why we're really excited to bring it to you. It's a tremendous time of year. I used to hate the fall because it meant that cold weather was coming and less opportunity for turtle related stuff. But the truth is like around this time, we're still getting a little bit of eggs and we've kind of made it through this egg season. And now, you know, eggs are hatching and they will be for several months still. So we thought it'd be cool if we had one of the uh, absolute best private breeders in the country here to talk to us about what he's got going on. And then Steve and I could add a little bit about what we're doing on a much smaller level than Chris and uh, maybe answer some questions as well about some of those species. So um, Chris, uh, is, is there anything right now going on that kind of has you excited uh, as far as maybe in the incubator? Um, <clears throat> yeah, there, I mean, there's still a lot of stuff in the incubator. One, one thing I'm really excited about is um, uh, Testudo Graeca americensis, that's the Moroccan tortoise, or what you know we call in the American trade the Moroccan Greek. Um, I've been working with them for a while now and just finally started getting eggs. So that's in there. They are obviously aren't hatching yet, you know, but um, there you go. That's a picture from today. Ooh. Yeah. That uh, was today? How, how, uh, what, was the, uh, what was the high temp today? It was 76 today, but inside that greenhouse, it was like 98. So, wow. Wow, so it was warmer here in Connecticut than it was uh, where you are. That's so interesting. No kidding, really? Yeah, it's been really – it's a warm week this week here. Oh. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be like, you know, high 70s. I think we're going to hit 80 like two days, and then the nights are pretty chilly, but I like it. It's, it's nice, and the chilly nights are, are making a lot of species breed during the day because they're cooling down at night, and then they, they come out in the day, and they warm up, and then the males immediately have one thing on their mind. So, you know, there's – but that's, you know, a lot of species breed in the fall. So That's so interesting. So, so why – <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, why are you interested um, in in the Moroccans? Why are you Why are you excited about the Moroccans? Is that's not just another Greek tortoise? Well, they're they're recently, you know, they recently made them valid. You know, they've they've always toyed around with that tax on, but they uh, it's now one of the you know validly accepted Greek tortoise subspecies, and they're. They're rare, you know, they're not, um, the, the imports that were coming in the last few years into the United States were not all pure Americansis. They were a mix of tortoises from Morocco or North Africa. Some of them were the nominate race, you know, Greca Greca. Some of them were Americansis. They came in riddled with all kinds of parasites, you know, typical cliche story of importing wild animals and just about none of them survived. Um, and I, I actually only know one person who's, who's hatching them. Everybody else has either had no success or lost them all. I imported my own long-term group that had nothing to do with those um, droves of tortoises that came in. And they, um, they, they're, they're just a phenomenal group of animals. They're extremely hardy because they're healthy and they're not, you know, freshly wild caught or anything. Mm. And they're, they're, they're proving themselves out now. And, and a lot of people over there, a lot of the experts in Europe will say that, you know, that's the one Greek tortoise that even as a baby, they're just totally different, you know? And, um, they're, they're, they're really neat. You know, I mean, we really shouldn't even call them a Greek tortoise at all, you know, but I mean, Greek tortoise in itself is an improper term, but we don't have to talk about that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. That's really cool. I think what's interesting to hear from you, like such a testudo expert, and I'm not surprised that you started with that, but um, just to hear, right. yeah, just to hear the differences and 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 that sort of thing. Any difference as far as like their behavior, 
uh, compared to other Greeks or their cold tolerance or, or adult size or anything like that? Their adult size is, uh, is smaller. You know, um, I mean, I do have a female that's over 1500 grams, but as compared to a, you know, Ibera that can be over, you know, uh, um, uh, 3000 grams, you know, um, it's, it's a big difference. You know, most of my females are in the 800 to 1,000 gram range. Males are 500, 600 grams. Um, their behavior is pretty classic of, of you know, testudo grica. They ram, they bite, they're outgoing, they're, they're robust, you know. Um, in terms of their uh, cold tolerance or, 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 you know, climate preference, they come from Morocco. So primarily they're subjected to heat, dry heat. But um, parts of northern North Africa, they, they can hibernate, you know, and they, they're subjected to some pretty severe cold. But the problem is they're pretty new to the trade. They're, they're new to just, you know, testudo in general. And people who had them didn't really know who they had, what they had. And those that have them now, we're, we're just, we're kind of learning, you know. Um, they can probably hibernate in a dry heat, even, even though it'll get pretty cold. But, um, you know, they're, they're, they're different. They're definitely different in terms of um, their, their, their daily cycle, you know. Um, so I wanted to tell you about one and I, I, I think before I go there, I, just to, to follow up on the Moroccans, I, I think, you know, as we talk about some of these testudo species, you know, I'd like the listeners to keep in mind that these are really smart choices as far as, you know, animals that should and could be kept in, in captivity. Uh, we see all the time, these popular species that people want to get that are large and difficult to take care of. And, um, you know, these guys are are really just a good choice. And and going with that, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about a project that I'm kind of excited about, um, and that is the um, little itty bitty adult leopard tortoises that um, have come into my possession. And I, I wanted to to talk about them just because. Um, while Chris is here as well, and we, we've spoken about them, uh, Chris, a, a little bit. And um, the male is an adult. He's, he's 10 years old, uh, nine years old, actually. And he, um, he's less than eight inches in length. And then the female is less than nine inches. So they're very, very, very small, um, very small. And uh, they actually laid eggs. And the clutch size, I believe the minimum is six. It might be eight. But anyway, the female laid four eggs, and they look okay. So we're kind of interested that we might be working with a, a very small locale of adult leopards. That, that would make it – I mean, they're a popular tortoise. They're obviously beautiful. People are interested in them because, of they, because they look good. But, um, you know, one of the drawbacks is that they are a large tortoise species. So um, – I know, Chris, you have quite a few leopards, and they're definitely a lot bigger than the ones that I have. <laughs> well, remember I told you that the recent acquisition uh, of a, a family down in North Carolina that couldn't um, take care of them anymore. The male, I am not, I don't, I'm not 100% on his history, but <clears throat> excuse me, the female is very small. She's actually, going back to the testudos, she's smaller than some of my eyebrow. Um, I, I haven't measured her. She's probably somewhere around 10, 10 and a half inches. She's very small. She's very old, very smooth, you know, very patternless. So whatever locale she may have originally come from could be like yours, you know, where they're just really small. But then, yeah, I have, you obviously have seen them in person, some huge, you know, very big leopards um, that are bigger than almost everything in my collection. Right. Look at those things. So beautiful. Yeah, yeah. The one on uh, the darker one is a South African giant leopard which was stigmachelli's pardalis pardalis and the lighter colored one the smaller one is the classic east african leopard or what you know used to be uh stigmachelli's pardalis babcockeye so um you big can one. see at least from a morphological standpoint that there's a difference there but um those are big animals those are really big animals that's so cool that's so cool yeah, there's that south african again the female and there, oh, she, yeah. there she is with her male. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's neck and neck with her. He's almost as big. Making babies. Baby leopards. <laughs> I'm just going to keep my comments to myself because 
PG. I want to be allowed. I want to be allowed back on the next podcast. And um, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> that's awesome, man. That's awesome. So, uh, how many leopard eggs have you gotten this year? Um, Com compared to my four leopard eggs <laughs> that I'm excited about. I think. I forget what's up there, but we actually just got a clutch last night from uh, from an <laughs> from an East African. She's a young female, though. She broke four out of the nine that she laid. Mm. Um, but I think uh, from East Africans, there's I don't know, maybe twenty five to thirty, and I've gotten two clutches of South African for a total of making you do math. You're welcome. Which I ain't good at. Um, one. Four. That's why we need. That's why we need Steve. Murphy, I need some fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't. It's only like I think I only have like nine or ten South African. Oh wow! Yeah, because remember that second clutch? There, there yeah. wasn't you know. So, um, but the first for her first clutch of six was all was all good and intact. So. That's awesome. There's, there's some leopard tortoises up there. Wow, that's really awesome. So now, now you, you come back and you tell me something else you have going on. I'm just going to put these back up here because that's a cool picture. You are you're a hornball. That's what that is. <laughs> I'm fine. Here, this is still a cool picture. That's a gorgeous tortoise. I like the tortoise she sex is beautiful. better. She is, you know, that pair in general, uh, especially her, they are some of my absolute favorite um, – you know, tortoise is my collection. You know, I, I, everybody knows that my my ultimate favorites are the testudos, but just from a, you know, an individual animal standpoint, they're just phenomenal animals. You know, they really are. I mean, and and you know, we had Anthony no scare with the female this year, the a South African. She got very sick during the um, that really crazy heat wave we had when it was like a hundred every day here for like two weeks almost. And, uh, I mean, the real feel was like 105, like two or three of those days. And, uh, That's so interesting. I mean, this is, this is a tortoise from Africa. You would expect them to be great but, in the heat. You know, again, I don't want to talk too long about leopard tortoises, but real quick, just because this keeps triggering things. Today, actually, um, this woman, Carol, who used to work with the Bronx, uh, Bronx Zoo and the Turtleback Zoo and, and all those different tri-state zoos, she had a female leopard tortoise uh, that she raised from hatchling 30-something years, 32 years ago. Uh, gave it to the zoo on exhibit and had a contract with them that once they gave up the, the tortoise, it would go back to her. Well, long story short, she placed it with us and we actually got that tortoise today. That's so um, cool. It's a big, you know, standard sized East, East African, but, um, you know, they're, uh, I don't know. They're, they're, they're just, they're phenomenal tortoises, you know. There's a reason why they're so popular. I think about that all the time with store with, with uh, star tortoises and, and other, you know, really popular species. But um, there's a lot of species that people don't know about, but everybody knows about leopards and everybody knows about star tortoises and everybody knows about radiateds. Um, that's really cool. That's really, really cool. Um, so we haven't spoke, spoken about anything uh, Asian yet, and I, I, have, I have a problem with that because I'm, I well, love – We've got, we've I got love, some good news in the Asian department, so let's talk about it. Do you let, Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Hit me with some good Asian news. Oh, me? Oh, you don't want to? Oh, you, you're talking about – oh, you're good. You're following along on the chat on the side. You're yeah, so I, I am. I mean, I do have an, an Asian turtle announcement, but it's not the only one that we have as the turtle room. We've had, a, we've had a big year with Asian stuff. We have. We have. We have. We have. We're very big in Asia. Very big in Asia. We're like, the, <laughs> we're like the Beatles. Anthony, you're big no matter where you go. Yeah, That's you're true. big no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good, Steve. Thank you. Hey, anytime. So, Steve, you have you have an Asian an announcement, and I just cut you well, off. Please I mean, continue. most people most people have seen gotten to see these already. But of all the Asian species we have, these are probably the first ones to um, to hatch this year. So uh, we can just uh, toss them back up here. People have seen us talking about these on Facebook since May, and these are <laughs> our gorgeous uh, four eyed turtle hatchlings you can see that cute little foot there oh that's cute <laughs> you said it you said have it have a sphagnum have moss it. sticking to his face this is when uh they were one day old one day old and so now they're a bit older than that let me grab another picture here um have you made them into soup yet oh we have a 
a, a comment from a listener wants to know if you had them in soup yet. No, definitely not. Mm. So here you can see this is um, oh, about a month yes. ago now. All three lined up. Uh, this guy has been a little picky with his eating, unlike the other two, but still growing. He likes fruit already. Like, he'll turn down pellets for fruit. The That's other two, awesome. not so much. It's still weird. Sounds like my nephew. Mm. <laughs> uh, come on, where's... Steve, I love, your, I love your nail polish in this one, Steve. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely not my hands. These were taken when I was in uh, Charleston. Oh, yeah, yeah. But so there's a there's one picture of the little guy and I thought there was another good better picture but maybe that was it I think that was it. They're great. They're great. So uh, so can awesome. you tell us a little bit about the four-eyed turtle? Um, you know, uh, endangered species lives in the same basic area as Spangleri and the Chinese big-headed turtle. And not everybody needs to see my inbox there. Um, <coughs> Uh, so one of the cool parts about about that area is um, basically same mountain ranges but different levels of elevation so the four eyes live I think it's between I think it's 200 to or 100 to 500 meters or something like that and then after they stop the Spangleri basically start and then the big heads kind of overlap both of them a little bit but they, they don't really live together because they all do s live in some slightly different habitat despite living basically in the same general range area. So, I, you know, I always think that's kind of neat that you've got three species that basically if you looked at the range maps would be significant overlap, but you won't really ever find um, two of them, you know, two of the species to hanging out together. I think this is a really good story too about like what the, what the turtle room kind of – does and embodies and just tries to um, accomplish with their combined efforts. We, we basically we were able to acquire a male and um, Steve and I kind of pulled our pennies together to, to get that male and then we got another male and then we're sitting here with two males like what the heck are we doing and we ended up um, communicating with a gentleman, such a nice guy, who bought a hatchling four-eyed turtle years ago and grew it up and ended up being female and she starts laying eggs never been with a male but just laying eggs periodically one or two clutches a year and he said yeah i'd like to work something out so that we could breed this female i said okay well you know if you want to send her to us we'd love to to try to make it happen and that's exactly what we did and and we've been successful and it's such a good feeling when something like that works out there's obviously risk involved for this gentleman there's risk involved for us and you hope that everything works out um, and that everyone could still be friends in the end and be happy in the end. And, and this is one of those stories that's really turned out well. And, um, it, you know, a bunch of people just being um, selfless and trying to, to make good things happen. And, and when it works out, it really is a good feeling. So awesome. great job, Steve. Great job, Steve. And thank you to that gentleman. You know who you are. I'm not going to say your name because I didn't ask you for permission to say your name. But uh, anyway. Good job, Steve. Yay. Ooh, that's a nice photo. Oh, that was a nice photo. Yeah, this photo. was actually when they were about a week old back in May. That looks better than the other so one. So this is the one we call number one. This is the one we call number two. And this is the one we call number three. Awesome. They're great little turtles. Um, hardy for the most part. Um, don't need, you know, constant water changes at this age, which is nice, but. My wife loves these suckers. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got one, right? Or several. A wife? <laughs> ah, I walked right into that one. No, I don't know. Got I don't a, know. Everybody's got a favorite or several. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not my wives. Wife has, my wife has several favorites besides me. You're right. <laughs> and they're not just turtles. It's all sorts of things. She likes Cheetos more than me. She likes, uh, she likes the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and... Atlanta and anywhere more than me. So for instance, those are things that my wife likes more than me. There's more if you guys want, but we can say that for a different podcast. <laughs> like what my turtle hobby does to my wife. Actually, that's already been one, hasn't it? That was a good Yeah, one. we sort of talked about that already. We can do it though. It's like you just bring the wife on again and then just talk about the same thing, but just call it like title it differently, you know? If we like bring by the end it's just like bring Casey on, it's gonna make everybody mad though. <laughs> 
Because your wife doesn't hate it? Yeah. Your wife oh, you're, so, it. you're such a loving husband. I'm so sick of it. I love my wife, and she <laughs> loves me and my turtles. I was just kidding. <laughs> Gosh. Don't you know that people that complain about their wives are just kidding? <laughs> just kidding. She's the sweetest. She's so wonderful. I have 104 turtles, and it's all because of her. Without her, I'd have 200 turtles, but no house. Okay, I think you said <laughs> And no wife. <laughs> and no wife. <laughs> and no friends. And I'd be dead. Yeah. Now we just need to get you and her to Denver next August. Hint, hint, Ooh. hint. The headlines. Large man gets eaten by his own turtles <laughs> after he dies because he didn't feed himself. Oh, Den- Denver sounds awesome, man. Oh, I- I've always wanted to go out there. You know, you know what? You-, you remember what that hint, hint, hint is, right, Chris? Mm-hmm. Yep. Hopefully you'll be there too. Yep, that that is the plan. Go to some what, Denver. What's the hint, hint, hint? Just kidding, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, conversation killer. Sorry. Uh, another Asian Asian species species that we wanted to talk about is the jagged shelled box turtle, and one of us has experience very recently with this species. Some exciting experience. And um, he's he's going to talk about it right now. Who is that person? That will be me. Oh, we have a winner. Uh, this yes, yeah, this is my Murphy. Jeez, this is my first uh, hatchling Cora Mahadi. Uh, Mahudi Mahadi Mubahabahajiai. It's turtle. Yes, it is a turtle. And it's Asian. It's endangered. And in my opinion, it is so underrated. I think this species is incredible. And now, respectfully, I have a lot of Asian turtles in our collection, but the Asian genre is my least favorite. However, these guys, I just think, are incredible. They're, I think they're very underrated. I think a lot of the other species, like the, uh, you know, the flowerbacks, you know, the picturata, the galbinifrons, the, and then and then the trifasciatas and all that stuff. I think they get a little more ooh ah, you know. But I think these guys are really underrated, and and I think once they're established and they're set up correctly, they are some of the most personable, outgoing, robust, brawny, uh, amazing turtles to work with. And I was really really excited to to hatch one finally, you know. And I mean, what a beautiful baby you know gorgeous and i want to say when Ooh, when right. chris is talking he's saying some scientific names so please forgive him if you don't know the scientific is names this? he's talking about fl- flowerback box turtles and golden coin box turtles of yes. the of the same genus as, as this jagged jagged shelled box turtle which is the genus cora that's the asian box turtles and some of you out there might know the jagged shell more as the keeled box turtle Right. Yes, thank you. Another common name. And this is why we use scientific names so often, because there are multiple common names for lots of different turtles. Yeah, some turtles have them. as we referred to the Greek tortoise earlier, there are two tortoises that are known by the Greek tortoise common name, depending on what country you're from. Right. There are 10... Greek tortoise in Greece, they're talking about a whole different thing than if we say Greek tortoise over here. That's the biggest problem with it. There's only one type of Greek tortoise that's even found in Greece. So, and it isn't the Greek tortoise. And and it's the one that they want to make a full species. So it won't even be that, you know? But right. again, right. getting off topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Chris, was this the um, nominate subspecies or Osti? The um, – that's a good question because the male is an Osti. The female – was kind of up in the air because she had a, a, a certain amount of black coloration on the plastron, but it, it kind of went back and forth, back and forth. So when we announced it, you know, we just announced it as, you know, Cora Mahadi, I, Cora Mahudi, however you want to say it. Um, and, uh, you know, dad is definitely an obsti. Mom, I've got 50%. Actually, I'll say I've got 75% saying she's obsti and like, you know, 25% saying, no, that might be the nominant, you know? So, That's, yeah. So interesting. Regardless, uh, I mean, the, it, it is such a uh, it's such a cool little turtle, and I've been tracking its weight. It's it's a, it went it hatched at eight grams. It's already ten, um, and it, it's just a little, little guy sitting right up there. He's he's already eaten out of my fingers and guy girl. I don't know what it is. So that's so awesome. That's so great. Congratulations and, again. And real one last little thing about that species. For anybody who was following, we recently took in a, a big confiscation from United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and of all those species we took in, 
it's the Mahuti that have really taken off and really, um, you know, got, got out of that fragile stage pretty quick. So it's, again, I think that they're really, you know, once, once they, they're given a little TLC, they're TLC, they're really a rewarding species to work with. Right. That's so great. That's so cool. Congratulations again. I mean, the, the, the photos speak for themselves. Um, I think it's amazing how, uh, just how absolutely stunning that thing is. Yeah. And, I mean, they're, they're attractive turtles anyway, but that, when you see that hatching, it's like seeing a hatching galbinifrons. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's, uh, to me, it was even more shocking because a lot of the galbinifrons are really colorful as adults. And uh, some of the Mahuti are, are not as much, but um, really, really awesome. Everyone's reading the text on the side now. Yeah, trying to get a couple. Where is this right here? So um, one project that we work on every, um, that we've been working on for a while and are very, very pleased with and very happy about um, is a species that I wrote a book about and that I care about a lot. And Chris keeps them and Steve keeps them and I keep them. And um, we put a lot of stock and effort, uh, energy into this species. And um, we're lucky enough to be uh, one of the groups or, or some of the people that produce them every single year. And that's the Vietnamese black-breasted leaf turtle. Um, look at that gooey, ugly deliciousness. Um, that was obviously right when it was about to come out of the egg, uh, the, the first one that we hatched this year. And um, we have actually the most prolific pair in the stud book, and this is another hatchling from that same pair. Um, the stud book's been around for decades, but um, our pair has only been listed since 2013, but it's already produced more hatchlings than any other pair in the history of the stud book. So we're very proud of that, and eventually we'll probably be told to stop producing from this pair <laughs> but um it's you know it's pretty cool and um they're you know once you kind of get them dialed in they could be really great and that pair is obviously very much dialed in uh we have some other ones that are we're still waiting and it you know it could take a few years before they settle in because they need to cool down and then um have a you know a warmer year to put some weight on and then a cooler year maybe to induce some breeding so um anyway something that's gone pretty well for us and that we hope to improve upon in the future. I think uh, cumul cumulatively between the three of us, I think we have somewhere around 25, uh, 25 of them right now, if my memory serves me right. Something like that. That's pretty awesome. So Steve, is there a question? Is that what I'm seeing? You are. You see it in the chats. You should see it right there. You guys want to see something crazy? Good question. All right. I'm going to go away for two seconds. Talk amongst yourselves. Seriously, have a conversation. <laughs> All right. Sounds good, Chris. Uh, Anthony. And I almost just called him Chris, even though he's like twice your size. <laughs> Most people are at least twice my height. So, <clears throat> um, so you've had a lot of crap this year, right? I mean, that's like... Yeah. You know. So of, of all the things you've hatched this year, which one's the one you're most excited about for 2017? Because, I mean, the Western Hermans are always exciting because you love them. Like, Yeah, um, I mean, them, I'm excited. Like, I'm really excited for some of the new locales that I'm working with, but, you know, I haven't even gotten eggs from them yet. So um, I'm trying to think. Uh, the the Mahuti was really exciting, you know. Um, I had a nice letdown, <laughs> which you know about, you know species that I've been working my tail off to produce and keep hitting a, a wall with. Um, Cursina angulata, the bowsprit or angulate tortoise. Um, that was going to be, you know, I think my 2017 highlight. But uh, once again, the egg developed to almost full term and then the hatchling perished. And this is a number of times that this has happened. Um, and despite all my efforts in researching a better way to do things, all the different methods I've tried are failing. So I have yet to find a method that works, um, that, that, you know, according to certain resources works to them, works for them. Um, 
on a high note though, the adults are absolutely thriving um, and uh, continue to lay eggs, some viable, some not. So hopefully maybe, maybe it'll be, uh, maybe there will be a change in 2018 because now I'm trying oh. something else different with them. So have you and Casey considered just doing with your living room what that one guy is it in Germany does with his living room? What? <laughs> the habitat is the living room. There's a couch uh, in the middle no, of the No, no turtles and tortoises in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought I was <laughs> <laughs> No. Um, I figured that would be an amazing that's my, one to talk about. Believe it or not, that's my rule. Like, Casey, if I, if I was like, hey, Casey, yeah. we can keep a couple species in the house, she'd be like, sure. But I'm like, nope, that we've got a building. We've got the yard. They're staying out. But so I am now leaving the eggs in the enclosure to see if that right. does anything. And I've got probes in the substrate where the eggs were laid. So I'm monitoring the humidity and the temperature and it is, it's going up and down, up and down, up and down, but that's how it would be in nature. So maybe this is what's going to do it. And maybe in 90 to hundred days or whatever, I will see a little hatchling walking around in the enclosure. And the good news is it's a small tortoise. It's not, we're not talking about a wood turtle or a Gulf coast box turtle here. That's going to make a, a meal out of its offspring. That's true. So, true. you know, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic with it. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. I will say too, what's really cool, you know, people all the time look at Chris and like, oh my gosh, he's got so many cool animals. He's got a business. It's what he does for his for his job. This is amazing. And really what people don't understand is that Chris's job is it, like entirely frustrating and difficult. And he's he's so wonderful. It's one of the things I appreciate about him most is his customer service and his, his you know, caring about the bigger picture and all that type of stuff. But it, it is a challenge. But I think- it's the hardest job in the world. <laughs> really, the thing that, that we should all be jealous of is this guy, this is a guy who on his property has hundreds, thousands? Not thousands. <laughs> 8,000? 8, 8,000? 800? No, 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 no. Dude, no, if no. I have 104 animals, you have- at least think, a thousand and four. No, I, okay. I think we we you probably mean, have between four and five hundred. You know, but no, I mean, no, if you're don't, not, don't make me miss my point, though. Don't make me miss my point. Yeah, okay. I'm cutting you off right now. That's it. You're in timeout. That's it. Corner. Okay. Or can I stay? The thing that people should be jealous of. Hello, black glove. Is the fact that you don't have <laughs> an animal in your house? What besides a dog and a bird? Yeah. How is that yeah. possible? That's pretty awesome. For a guy who has hundreds of turtles and tortoises, you don't have an animal in your house. That, well, we have, we have the dog and we have our rescue parrot who is chasing me out of the house now. He's so damn loud. Awesome. So, But, yeah, no, there's no turtles in the house. The incubators are upstairs, though, in the guest room. So, technically, there's a turtle in the house every time an egg hatches. But. Yeah, but it's brief, and then it gets put into the rearing unit, you know. But, yeah, the yeah. incubators are in there only because I can't put the incubators out here because they'll, they'll, they'll cook the eggs because it gets so hot out here. That's you cool. Know? I think I'm perspiring me too i'm sweating <laughs> watching you sweat <laughs> looks oh. like the classroom guys that was a joke that was a <laughs> let me no let ac me, baby let me answer this question now the question was steve the question was anthony speaking of asian species did you get the spinosis the spinosis talking about uh the spiny turtles and um I just wanted to show this, and he's probably gonna he's probably gonna go to the bathroom on me because he likes to do that. This is like the record, like like close to the world record spiny turtle. Thing is absolutely insane. Oh, and I just touched it with my bare hand. I want to try to stay clean. But I don't know if you can see that. That is a huge like I'm a large man with a huge head. Okay, my size eight baseball cap. Man, that, that is a awesome. Huge spiny turtle. How old is he? Do we know? The so they came from a veterinarian in Connecticut. Who look at that! Look at that! Pla look how concave that plaster is. How amazing is that? You can make oh, yeah. That's one of the coolest things with them. Like this turtle's unbelievable. You know, several like we're talking like six, seven years old, and then all of a sudden the male plaster is just—it's like they're imploding. Like I've I've actually helped raise some of them from you know four-inch animals till they got bigger, and even at like six seven inches male female they're both like completely flat and so, then they just start they just start imploding you know after they like hit eight inches or more long so these came from a, a vet dr thomas milos in connecticut who had them for about 25 years 
And wow. he, he talks about, I mean, he says that this turtle is over 80 years old. I don't know the history on it past, you know, before the 25 years. Obviously, I would assume it wasn't here for that long. But I mean, by looking at the turtle, um, so I, I, so I did, I went out and, and spoke to, um, the gentleman, uh, Bill Hughes from the Tennessee Aquarium and Chris Hagen from the TSA, um, both have done extensive work with the spiny turtle, um, the Tennessee Aquarium and Bill Hughes, he's the keeper of the stud book for them. So I wanted to know if they had any record of a Spinosa that big and they don't, but, um, which is which is amazing. They could actually look back to their date their data like in the database and see if they have a male that big and they don't. But um, so what what is how big is he again? He's twelve inches. He's foot long. Uh, Thirty five hundred and fifty grams. Absolutely massive. Wow. So I mean, I can show you like a normal adult to show you what they look like in comparison. Um, while we're here. I always I always compliment Chris because he has like the most uh, the most like sophisticated tapping ever. Like I, I like to tap and I like to think like I'd be a good drummer. And then oh, I hear him tapping, like, oh my I was, God. I was, I, was, I, was I was a drummer for some time and that was my favorite instrument. So this is an adult spiny turtle. So you see the difference. I mean the one I was holding before was absolutely massive. Crazy. That thing, is, that thing is unbelievable, man. Yeah, so it's really, really, really. This is a female, so we have females now as well. We got so the 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 veterinarian, um, the lovely veterinarian who who reached out to the turtle room to talk about um, the future for his spiny turtles. Um, he had four males. He had a really awesome custom built enclosure that was on top of the cages where you would keep the animals in the vet office. It was in the vet oh. office. It was crazy. Oh. Like he had him at work. His wife probably didn't let him take him home. We understand, <laughs> but. Um, it was it was absolutely amazing, and um, he only had four males and had four males for a really long time. So this is a ram, rambunctious group that um, you know probably uh, is more than starved for female attention. So we've we've already gone out uh, with the help of uh, one of our partners um, to get some females. So the group right now that's here is four point three, so seven adults, including that humongous male. So we're excited about it and, and hoping that we do something do something. Uh, um, you know, productive. good with them in, in the future. Productive. Thank you. But, I, um, I love Spinosa. They're so fan yeah. amazing to me. And you know what? They're another completely underrated Asian species. They really, really are. You know, and, and that's the thing, you know, like you've got species like Spinosa as they grow, Mahuti as they grow, they get more of a uniform color. You know, they seem to take on their background a little bit more, um, darker colored shells, muted, you know, pigment, you know, and, and, it's sad because it, especially in the private sector, in the hobby, these species are the ones that get uh, ignored because they don't have a star pattern or they're not bright red or they're not purple, you know, or, or, or whatever. And it's a shame because they're, they're an amazing species, you know? But, well, I mean, I mean they do, people want them when they're small. But, you know. Yeah. And then it's like, it's almost like the, the uh, let me buy a puppy. And then when the puppy grows up, I don't want the dog anymore. You know, it's, yeah. it's sometimes it's similar. So like, oh, this turtle's not pretty anymore. It's like, well, yeah. I think it looks pretty damn awesome. You know, it looks yeah. like a dinosaur. Right. Now, let me ask you real quick before we go to that picture. Um, with Spinosa, are the males the heart of your sex? Is that why there's, you know, the longevity with these things or, or, the, or an abundance of them? It could be. It could be. Uh, um, Bill Hughes told me that the, um, that the ma males are the more abundant species. So I'd assume that that's probably the case. Because, you know, that's the case with some species with um, – um, or, or, or it's reversed, you know, Western yeah. Hermans, Spengler Eye, the males are, you know, the weaker of the sexes. You know? Egyptians. Egyptians, right. yep. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and some of those species, you need males, like with Egyptians, you need the combat and you need the mm -hmm. multiple males, which makes it yeah. even tougher to set something up because they're so expensive, so mm -hmm. tough to come by, and then the males, you know, you need multiple as well. Yeah. So, Blanding's turtles too. Blanding's, yeah, but, well, the males are... Just as hardy as the females. And you don't want to set up a group without multiple, though. And no, you don't. Harder, you don't. And they're harder to come by. They're very hard to come by, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, picture. Picture time. Speaking of giants. Speaking of giants. 
Whoa, Mr. Mons. That's Mr. Mons, the male marginated tortoise here. One of our males, our 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 fifteen inch male. Um, Who's that holding him? Tommy Lee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Um, <laughs> it's it's interesting because, and you know what's funny is when when Ken and Harkin was here, he brought up a good point because we were we were he did a little feature on him. We don't really know how big some of these animals gets get, and that's partially because in the wild where these things are taken or eaten, it's the big ones that go, you know. And um, there, you know, you, you hear about records surfacing, you know, the Spinosa, like uh, that's a massive animal. This Marginata is, is he's tremendous, you know. And even that that Ibra that I have from Turkey, you know, she's she's bigger than some of my leopard tortoises, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the um, I I was helping Russ um, edit this year's upcoming Battiger magazine, and there's an article in there um, about the South African giant leopard yeah. tortoises, and and it's funny, like you know, a lot of the record or close to record sizes that are really noteworthy are just empty shells because mm -hmm. they were obviously Pritchard's in great, place. great shape. Yeah, right. Look at some of the radiated tortoise shells that Pritchard has in, at the Colonial Institute, you know, Research Institute. They're they're huge. Some of them are 18, right. 19 inches. You know, I mean, there's probably bigger ones, and even uh, even some of the the red foot tortoise shells that he has, and those are the ones that got eaten. You know, right. So right. there was a there was a photograph. I'm, I don't want to share it because the guy I know is in the photo, and I don't know if he'd be okay with it. But um, Marco Rinaldi, who's who's an author on Testudo. He went and visited a um, a keeper in Serbia, and he there's it's on Facebook. He's got photos of of an eastern, you know, common Testudo Hermani Bokeri, eastern Herman's tortoise, and this thing is, I mean, it's like this. It's tremendous, mm. you know. So there's another example, and that's a wild animal. So, mm. you know, we don't know just how big some of these things really do get. Um, Steve, do you have the uh, the pick of uh, marginated marginata hatching, the marginated tortoise hatching? Because that's another one too. I have some of them incubating. I know Chris, you have some of them incubating. Yeah, the very late year on those, but I did. I have multiple clutches now, um, firing over a couple pictures of little boobos. I sent Steve one. I don't know if he can hear me. There it is. Steve, oh. hang on, I'm sending you some too. Yeah. <laughs> There's some, some hatchling marginated that, um, that I hatched last year. But now, I, so I just got the first clutch on the ninth, t um, two days ago. Mm -hmm. Two days ago, I got the first. Um, it's like, it's so cold that it's almost time to bring them in here. And they finally lay the first clutch of the season, of course. Last year, she laid on Halloween, which here, I mean, that's, Halloween is very cold. So. Um, here it is. Sometimes it's 75 degrees here, you know. Depends. Yeah, it's it's cold. I mean, it's cold. Not at this point right now. We're getting into the 40s some nights overnight. Wow. So, you know, I've been taking the leopards in at night, and um, I haven't taken the. F I've only taken the Forstens in once. Mm -hmm. I usually for the threshold, I'll leave them out in, until it gets under 50, and I leave the leopards out until it gets under 56. Yeah. I leave them out when it's pretty cold. It's, it's been a late, you know, I, I attribute it to my move. Although your yours seem to be on schedule with mine with the marginateds, they have nested very, very, very late this year. All, all my females at the exact same time within the last three weeks have started nesting, you know, which... So interesting. Yeah, it's crazy, you know, but there's... Said, a, hmm? I thought you had a, a weird spring again, too. So, like, once you were getting them spring started... Spring was a mess. Yeah, spring was it a gets mess. warm, and then it gets cold again. It was, yeah, you know, I mean, it, the winter... I mean, I was in shorts most of February, you know, and then the marginateds went out, uh, like they usually do. I think I got them out a little bit later than usual. And um, they went through the whole season. And then, all you know, this whole time we're going, where, where, why aren't they nesting, you know? Oh, maybe it's because of the move, the move, the move. And then all of a sudden, boom, one after the other. And and one, a couple of them are onto their second clutches now. So, mm. but they're great. They're another good choice for people. But, again, they're overlooked, you know? How you have know, things been? Oh, I know that. I know that. How how have things been going with some of the North American species you're keeping? I mean, some of the uh, box turtles, Blandings, North American woods. To sum um, that up, wood turtles were minimal. You know, very. But they're sensitive to being moved. They were in that same pen for pff, ever. You know, um, so they were. They didn't do too much. There's some marginateds that were hatched. Uh, I think that was last year. 
Nice. Um, same thing last year. Oh, they, you always have to one up me. I thought my always, photo was good. They're always so mean when they come out. <laughs> um, but anyway, going back to the um, Mar um, American species, wood turtles didn't do much. Uh, Blanding's turtles, a little better. Spotted turtles did really well. Eastern box turtles did amazing. Um, what else? Um, the terrapins on the island where we're running the project, they're, they're pretty classic, you know, did normal nesting in, in, in the wild. So that's why I think a lot of my issues were not necessarily because of the, the weather patterns this year, but because of, um, you know, my, uh, my move. You yeah, know? well, yeah, you basically uprooted everybody. So mm -hmm. um, before we get sure. moving too far, a um, couple questions. First, um, most recently topic, um, what is the recommended temp for bringing in margin natives? Well, they, by nature, hibernate. So technically, there is no temperature to bring them in unless you're not prepared to hibernate them. Um, otherwise, I actually discussed two methods in uh, one of my latest articles, which is all about brumation, you know, hibernation. And what I like to do is, with any of the testudos that hibernate, marginated is included, is I leave them out all throughout fall because that's what you can't really replicate. You can't really perfectly replicate a cooling down. Okay. You can't just take the tortoises if you're going to hibernate them. You can't just take them because, okay, it's getting cold now. Boom, refrigerator, boom, basement, no light, no heat, no food. You have to let them gradually experience that. Otherwise you're, you know, you're looking at potential untimely death or at the very least one hell of a sick tortoise. So, um, if you're going to just bring them in and keep them awake, you can let them be subjected to a little bit of cooling. It'll probably trigger some breeding, you know, which is nice. Um, I would say if you're not going to hibernate them, then depending on where you are in the continental U.S., you're looking at sometime in October bringing them in. Um, what I do, because I like mine to sleep for at least a little while, is I leave them out all the way until Christmas. And then once they've gone through that entire decline in temperatures, deteriorating weather, and they've experienced it at a gradual pace, then I bring them in and put them somewhere safe where they can finish out the winter, like the crawl space at my new house. At my old house, it was the basement where they can stay in the 40s and 50s and even occasional 60s because fluctuation is perfectly normal. Um, you know, but if you're going to just keep them awake, I would say, you know, the temperature threshold would be once the nights are consistently hitting the 40s, um, and not not getting higher than 60, then it's time to bring them in if you're going to keep them awake. Um, they're black. They absorb heat incredibly fast. Um, you can go out there on a day when it's only 55 degrees, and if it's sunny, the tortoises are warm to touch. Um, but I, I, that's, that's what I, if you're going to keep them awake, I'd say once the nights are consistently hitting 40s and days into the 60s, bring them in. I usually, I think for the cutoff for me, I think I go about 35 degrees the low overnight but i mean i think again and the thing that you can't replicate inside is 70 in the daytime and mm -hmm. and yeah. 40 at night or or 60 in the daytime and 35 at night like you can't replicate that indoors and i think that probably has something to do with it too because they're still eating and active and even laying eggs like right now like i said i've, I've left mine out and and she was out overnight in at about 45 44 degrees and then, you know, a week later, she's laying eggs. So, yeah. well, you know, they're, they're, they're a resilient species and, and in nature where, where they, where a lot of them occur in Northern Greece and, and, and just different areas like that, that's what they're subjected to. You know, they get that fluctuation, they get beat with rain and, and, and some days that are really unfavorable that are out of season to be unfavorable. You know, it's the same thing here. You know, May is supposed to be the nicest month of the year yet. I don't know what happened this year, you know? <laughs> I, I, I kept opening up my door every morning in May going, ah, it's still March. It's still March, you know, but it, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're hardy and they're hardy even as hatchlings too, you know? So, and it's another reason why they are, uh, you know, they, they deserve a little more respect because they really are rewarding species. Yes, they can get big, most likely not going to get as big as Mons, you know, I don't think most people are looking at 15 inches, but you know, um, they can handle it. They're a good one. So we had another question, and thank you. We had another question from. Um, and I, I answered it via. I just answered it via the chat window, actually. Oh, so we don't want to ask the question. Uh, it, uh, we could go back if you want to cover it. We could go. Um, 
Uh, viewers, you know, it's a species we already yeah. covered, angulated. If you want to just run by what we were just uh, – what I just asked you about, Chris, go for it. Oh, that was a that was a, a question from a yeah. viewer. Oh, okay. Well, we we yeah, could we, leave them in suspense. Yeah, we could. <laughs> if we wanted. Well, to. like I said, I answered it in the. I am no, but we you are know. in we are in suspense because the uh, the question is: Are there any viable angulata eggs incubating right now? And the the answer to that is we don't really know because we're leaving them in the enclosure now. Uh, it's a new method we're trying with them. There are um, some success stories with that method working. Um, one thing I'd like to squash about Angulata, which I recently read on one of the forums, there have been a couple of outdated pieces of information, which, you know, certain people swear that, um, Cursina or Cursina Angulata has to be kept outside in order to reproduce, thrive, yada, yada, blah, blah. I keep our Angulata exclusively indoors and I couldn't be happier with how much they're thriving, how healthy they are, how frequently they lay eggs um the problem is with getting the eggs to hatch so um whether or not that has something to do with um them being subjected to more natural cycle i don't know but that's why we're leaving them in the ground in my um out outdoor tortoise building because they will get quite a bit of fluctuation in there in here that's where i am and you've gotten you know very fertile eggs fertile eggs several times not to rub it in but <laughs> yes <laughs> It adds to you know your point, and mm -hmm. I think sometimes, like I said, it just takes takes a few years. How many years have you been working with them now? Four, three. Uh, three. This is the third year. I think. Three. So I mean, three years really in the scheme of things. We're talking about tortoises here, slow and steady. So well, you know what it, it is, takes that long. Yeah, the, but the frustrating aspect of it is, is is it's not you know it's they they you just keep getting the eggs. You know what I mean? Like they 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 started yeah. up again for the season. There's already two eggs in the ground. You know. And they're going to just keep going. You know, each female will lay one egg at a time between five and six times. So between now and April, you know, per, per adult female, you could have potentially five, six eggs each, you know. Wow. Now, if we start getting that kind of frequency of eggs, then we'll start, okay, we're going to leave these five in the ground. These five are going to go in this incubator. These five are going to get sent to Kmart. I don't know, whatever. Whatever's going to get these damn things to hatch, you know. But we'll figure it out. We'll so two-part question. Two-part question. How many adults do you have and how do I rob your house? Is that your question or someone else's? That was someone that it came in. I don't know who it was. It was like it, it was like a Snapchat. Like it, it showed up and then it went away. So I'm sorry. I'm lying. It was me. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> uh, if anybody wants to know how to rob me, they just got to ask Murphy. <laughs> Murphy is the um, is kind of the owner there. So yeah, <laughs> they're his turtles. So great. So I wanted to um, so bring Anthony up another one. actually wants to talk about emus. <laughs> I just I love um, <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to switch from emus. Terms, and we're going to go to birds. <laughs> I want to talk about emus, okay? <laughs> the joke that Steve is, is uh, making towards me right now is because I, I had written in the chat box that I wanted to talk about Emmys next, which is um, the European – the genus – that the European pond turtle is in and, um, and the Sicilian pond turtle. And, uh, apparently for some reason I hit the U instead of the Y and got emus. So next show we'll have to talk about emus. <laughs> so there's some European pond turtles, everyone. Yay. Hooray. Uh, this is, is so, yeah. So Chris Leone is making people's dreams come true and my wife. So, um, Chris had, a pair of these available at um, Hamburg. I called my wife. I asked permission. Pretty please, can I take them home? And she said yes. <laughs> Closer we can. Uh, <laughs> buy me. Buy me. Buy me. <laughs> Awkward zoom. Hey. Oh. That is I can see up your nose. Hey, you know they I do look different, nose. man. You see those leg stripes? Yeah. They're yeah. different. So these are these are Kura River European pond turtles. They're from the Kura River. Um, the scientific name is Emmys orbicularis iberica, and um, they're from Azerbaijan. So these are a subspecies that is not really um, in the United States. So I'm really excited to have hatched them. I have six hatchlings that came out. This is the first one. Uh, the last one hatched a couple of days ago. They've been hatching over the course of several weeks. And these are actually going to be a part of uh, some research. I'm really excited about that. Steve, thanks for helping with that. 
and uh, I'll be working with uh, Professor Russell Burke at Hofstra University, who needs some hatchling turtles of different species. So these will be uh, these, and probably a Spangler eye will be the first ones to go over there for his research, and then maybe some some other species as they as they hatch. So that's a really exciting one uh, that was uh, made possible by Chris Leone. Again, making dreams come true every day. <laughs> Is there anything you want to say about, about making people's dreams come true, Chris? I wish someone would bring me a cupcake. <laughs> and knowing you, you've had six cupcakes today. No, I didn't have any cupcakes today. That's oh, he's going that's... through cupcake deficiency. Yeah. Yes. Ah. Yes. He's got the shakes. Look at him. Just kidding. You have to look really closely. Fuck! Cupcakes! Jeez, you scared the living crap out of me. Woo! Uh... <laughs> oh, man. Is it hot in here? Scary. It's hot in here. Oh, Chris, are there any other species you want to tell us about? Because I'm I'm drawing a blank on what I should be asking about. <clears throat> uh, bleep, 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 bleep. Well, I mean, we had. Um, let me see. Where where's the picture? Let me see here. We've had some other things hatch. Um, you know, not out of the norm, but uh. Sorry, I'm taking so long here. I'm trying to find a picture. Here it is. Not out of the norm? No, not out of the norm. You know, done this before, although it's been a very slow last two years with this species. Um, again, I think because of all the uh, moving around, you know, buying the new property, moving the animals, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, Steve, I just sent you the photo. Uh, of which one? Sorry. Just came through. He's keeping it a secret. Well, I got figured it. It would, oh, got it. Um, he doesn't want to talk about it so everyone can see it. He's a gentleman. <laughs> okay. So we're doing that before the one you you you, you yes. said you wanted to do. Got Chris, it. Chris next. Chris next. Un momento, por favor. Chris, sophisticated drum roll, please. It's so exciting to Bam. me. Bam. Boom. Boom. Geochelon elegans, otherwise known as the Me Too tortoise, the Indian star. <laughs> the Me Too tortoise? Yeah, when I was when I was in high school, I drove a Civic, and I thought I was, I was so excited that I got a Honda Civic brand new, and everybody's <laughs> like, cool Me Too car, bro. And I was like, wait, what? And they're like, yeah, look at the parking lot. And I'm like, wah, wah, wah. But. I, I thought that was Me Too iguana. No, Me Too iguana. But <laughs> despite the fact that everyone else had a Civic in high school. I ran that car into the ground and got every single penny out of it. And I put like 200 and, oh God, I don't even know, 200 something thousand miles on it. So what I'm saying is, <laughs> although extremely common and everybody and their mother has them, Indian stars are a very awesome species to keep. They can be a little bit uh, sensitive at times. Sometimes if you look at them the wrong way, they get upset, but they are really rewarding. Absolutely, undeniably beautiful. And um, we had, you know, we had uh, two of them hatch here this week. So um, that's great. Congratulations! Uh, they're so beautiful, right out of the egg. You know, you look at them the wrong way, and they blow a bubble out of their nostril. They do. They're like. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, and so what's funny is, you know, um, speaking of star tortoises, Burmese star uh, nesting season starts any moment now. Um, you know, they start laying the fall into the winter. I call them winter layers, you know, uh, along with, you know, the Indians were really out of whack this past year, you know, uh, which is why the hatchlings are hatching now. But, um, yeah, I'm getting off topic and I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk about another one. Thank you. I'll, I'll get it back on topic. I'll save it. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah right. And uh, for Famous the next one of Anthony's. Yeah. What he said. Apparently, I won't get it back on top. What? What is it? You can see it? Ooh. So this is, this, this is an exciting one uh, for the turtle room. Oh, yeah. That is a Reeves turtle from Japan. And that locale is very big and very black. And they are pretty awesome. And that's the adult female that is over nine inches, which is really big for a Reeves turtle. And um, she has laid 
17 eggs this year. Two clutches, a, a clutch of 12, which is a really big clutch, and so awesome. a clutch of five. And and it's really interesting that the eggs are very large compared to the eggs of some very large Chinese reefs turtles, which um, just pale in comparison uh, size-wise to, to this turtle. But it, it looks like a totally different turtle than you'd see with some of the, some of the Chinese ones. So really excited about that. Also have some quang tongues that are about to hatch here as well. Ooh, and those are we're excited about too. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll get to see some pictures of those next month. Maybe, maybe, because we are running out of time. Just saying. Running out of time for what? My dogs are barking. I'm embarrassed. So... I just looked at him. Quick things. I just I just looked at him, and, and <coughs> one of them blew a snot bubble out of his nose and nice. stopped barking. <laughs> so, um, the star tortoise. Our dear Ben has hatched uh, Cora Beretti this year. There's a couple of of what has hatched. Um, I think he said something around like four offspring of a couple lines or something like that. Um, but anyway, so that's Beretti. Um, and that's awesome. Beautiful. Oh, they're 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 pretty cool. They are cool. Yeah. And oh, there's an ambo. Yeah, I wanted to throw that guy up here. That's a you know, and that's a, this ambo is actually from the um, uh, from the turtle rooms group of animals. We've got oh, what fifty three, not including hatchlings, I think, that are scattered across a few of our sites. So there's um, a, a baby Cora ampoinensis camaroma from this year as well. That's awesome. Do we have any pictures of Cohelans, Chris? Yeah, I sent Steve a couple. Yep, I'm trying I've got to them. Find another one. I'm trying to find the egg laying shot because that was really – I don't think there's any other photo of it out so, there of this species actually wow, in so an beautiful. opposite position. And I don't know what I did with the damn photo. So the well, there's Cohelan, the babies. The Cohelan oh, box turtle, also known as the aquatic box turtle, is from a very small range in mexico and they are um more aquatic hence one of the common names and they're absolutely beautiful some people think they're a little more drab in coloration compared to uh some of the other species in the genus like the eastern box turtle but as you can see by this photo those are very beautiful turtles very unique turtles um, they're on the endangered species list, so they cannot be sold across state lines. So Chris is having a wonderful, uh, doing a wonderful job breeding them and is making no money off of it. Not that he minds because he doesn't do it for the money. Nope. Um, no, but, they're, um, they're really, uh, you know, I like to compare them to the Burmese star tortoise because their situations are similar. Um, you know, Burmese stars are fundamentally or functionally extinct in nature, meaning that, you know, what's left of their species in the wild is not really doing them any good. Um, the Cohelan box turtle is not that far, but they're, they are in pretty critical status with an estimated of only 2000 left, uh, in the wild. Um, and what's interesting about both species, the Cohelan or aquatic box turtle and the Burmese stars, despite their really sad statuses in nature, they are unbelievably prolific, robust, and, um, just outgoing. Uh, in captivity, um, even even when kept in naturalistic setups, you know they're they're really. Um, I mean, you guys have seen my Cohelans multiple times, and they are uh, they can take cold like a champ, despite the fact that they come from Mexico. And interestingly enough, the most recent female we acquired for our breeding group here came from Illinois, where it was hibernated naturally outside. So, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Okay. Cohelan box turtle hibernating outside in Illinois. That's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. That's a I couldn't even hibernate there. outside in Illinois. I can't hibernate outside, and I want to hibernate so bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
Speaking of braving the weather conditions outside, I just want to give a shout out to to so many of our friends that are in Texas and Florida. Um, it's been absolutely uh, awful, so devastating what's happened in. And we know so many people in those areas because there are so many animal people there who can keep animals um, because of the climate. So usually those those areas are more conducive to um, people being involved in hobbies like ours. And um, it's it, to say that there have been so many countless people on my mind over the past several weeks is an understatement. I know it's the same for you guys. And um, just our heart goes out to those guys. Some of the people who watch the podcast every single week, uh, I'm sorry, every single month um, are, are in areas that have been affected by uh, and some of the, some of our really important guests as well are in areas that were affected by the hurricane. So, um, you know, good luck to you guys. You're in our thoughts and prayers, and you know we think about you guys so many times every day, and we look forward to to hearing that you've been able to to get back on your feet, and and we hope that your animals are doing okay as well. So yeah, um, totally. And to um, to follow on with that. Um, Turtle Survival Alliance's Turtle Survival Center in Cross just received quite a lot of rain as a result of of Irma, and so they they probably could use some extra funds to help uh, get things going again um, and help recover a little bit. Granted, their damage won't be nearly as severe as many of those in Florida. Um, if you uh, feel so led to give, there's lots of great organizations um, that are doing good work in Houston. Uh, Southeast Texas and will be in Florida. I know um, the Red Cross, um, if you uh, are connected with um, the Catholic Church, you might, uh, Catholic Relief Organization is doing a lot of work. If you're in the, uh, if you're more on the Christian uh, church side of things, uh, non-Catholic, um, uh, bigger, big organizations like World Vision and Samaritan's Purse, who have lots of experience dealing with um, the aftermath of natural disasters, are also doing work in in the greater Houston area and will be doing work in Florida. So lots of different avenues to donate to uh, many different organizations depending on, you know, where your personal uh, allegiances lie. So, yeah. Stinks. But, um, you know, we, we just, we appreciate everything that our Florida and, and Texas friends and colleagues are, are going through and, and really sympathize with them and, and wish there was more we could do. So um, if you guys can help out or if we all can help out in any way, then I think that'd be a really good thing. So anyway. Sorry to add, sorry to end on a on a somber note. Well, it's not you know we I've heard from quite a few people that were met you know covering in this little <clears throat> spot here and they're they're doing a lot better than they thought they were going to be. So that's that's yeah. really uplifting to hear. You know, damage is pretty minimal. Um, family, relatively pets, speaking, of course. Yeah, um, families, friends, and pets. You know, and businesses seem to be from what I, the people I've heard. Okay. You know, not great. Okay, and uh, in in the end, that everybody has their lives still. Yep. You know. Well Can't said. Well said. Word up. I Good think uh, I think everybody in Florida, even those who take in the worst hit, feel blessed that they're not in the same position the people of Barbuda are. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, you guys have any uh, last additions you wanna you wanna talk about here before we uh, announce the next show and kind of hang up? Hmm. I'd just like to thank Chris for coming on. I, I think it's always a, a joy to have him on to talk about all the different species that he keeps. And what's better than the only thing better than turtles is turtle eggs, especially when they hatch. So I think that it's, it's a good time of year. It's a good time of year. It is. It is. And we all could appreciate fall, not only for our pumpkin lattes and uh, horror movies on TV, but uh, also for turtle eggs hatching. That's the ultimate goal. So, That's right. Yeah. All right. So our next show will be Monday, October 2nd. We'll be back to first Mondays of the month. And uh, maybe we'll celebrate Chris's birthday since it comes up just a few days after that. My birthdays so, don't matter anymore. <laughs> I've reached mm -hmm. that. I've reached that. 
<laughs> <laughs> He's old. Not that old. You're old. old. You're old. We call you Silver Fox behind your back. Oh, you can't call me Silver Fox. I have a good friend whose name is Silver Fox, and he's really silver. Yeah, but, I mean, he's your friend. You're my, you, out of all my friends, you're the silverest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not silver. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's oh. the camera adds, adds 10 pounds of brown tint. You ever heard of that? Yeah, well, because the other pounds on me is the cupcakes, not the cameras. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> That's, you, you did that to yourself. You added hey, that to hey, I'm, proud, I'm a proud cupcake eater. Don't blame the camera. You did that. <laughs> I could say that as a, as a 330 pound man, I could say that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very wide. I don't look that big because I'm tall, but I have very wide hips. That's why. <laughs> I'm sitting Lake on two Leone. feet. Lake Mione. <laughs> That's All great. right, kids. That's a nice well, uh, Happy hatching to everybody out there that keeps turtles and tortoises. And uh, to you too, Mother Nature. I hope you're happy hatching uh, turtles and tortoises in the wild. That's a really good, good point. That was really insightful. It was. Yeah, it was. A little lame, but... I thought it was beautiful. Poetic. <laughs> so I think Steve fell asleep. There he is. He's <laughs> On that comment? No, I think he fell asleep before. Oh, oh here you go. Everybody wants to know how to rock oh. me. <laughs> Oh, okay. um, for Anthony, Chris, and, Murphy, and Murphy. Yeah. And Murphy, and our moderator, Kevin, who I uh, had to cut out a couple minutes ago, I'm Steve, and we thank you for joining us again tonight, and we'll see you uh, on October 2nd. Have a good night. <laughs>